Welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Nature Connections webinar series from the Campbell Valley Nature House. So thanks for joining us today. My name is Jeff Roten. Um, I'm uh, with Metro Vancouver Regional Parks. OK, so we're going to get started now as people are joining us. So um, first of all, um, this webinar series is graciously hosted by Pacific Parklands Foundation. And I'd like to introduce their executive director, Janet Antonio, to say a few words about the foundation. Welcome, Janet. To start, I'd like to start by acknowledging that the Nature House is on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish First Nations. And I wish to extend our appreciation for the opportunity to hold this webinar on their shared traditional territories. Um, as well, uh, just to let you know a little bit about the foundation, the foundation was founded 20 years ago to <laughs> Metro Vancouver Regional Parks. So we raise funds and we give grants to protect our parks and to connect people with nature. So it's a pleasure to be here on these webinars and get to uh, connect with nature myself and join everyone. Um, so without uh, further ado, thank you to Jeff and to Michelle for being here today, to the Camel Valley Nature House for partnering with us and as well to the Wildlife Preservation uh, Organization that Michelle represents. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you, Jeff. Without further ado, um, I'm really excited to welcome Michelle Polly um, from Wildlife Preservation Canada, and she's going to talk about the Taylor's Checker, Checker Spot Butterfly. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jeff. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. This is my first Zoom webinar, so I hope it goes really well. I hope you find it interesting and informative. I'm going to share my screen now. There, there we go. go. Okay. There we go. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about the Taylor's checker spot butterfly. They're an endangered species of butterfly native to BC. <clears throat> and I have a special interest in them because my job is to raise them in captivity for release into the wild. So I'm a butterfly keeper. That's my day job. And I work for Wildlife Preservation Canada right here um, in Alder Grove at the Greater Vancouver Zoo. So that's where we do our field work. Um, so today we're going to talk all about the butterfly. What is their life cycle like? Where should they live? I have some videos to share with you and there will be some poll questions further on into the presentation. So let's get started. I like to start with big words in my, <laughs> in my presentation. So our first big word of the day is invertebrates. Um, I'm bringing this up because all animals fit into categories. And when we talk about animals, it's a lot easier if we can understand things about their lives by knowing what category they're in. So butterflies are in the category of invertebrates. And so if you reach behind you and you can feel your backbone in the middle of your back, that's your spine. All of those bones are vertebrae. And invertebrate is a word that means no spine. So butterflies do not have a spine, along with lots of other animals that also fit in this category. The smaller category they belong in is insects. In butterflies are all insects, along with things you are familiar with, like beetles. Um, and all insects have six legs, always six legs on an insect. So put that in your brain bank for later on. And the even smaller category that Taylor's checker spots belong in is Lepidoptera. So this is one of my favorite words. I'm working to become a Lepidopterist, which means that I study Lepidoptera. And that just is a big word that means moths and butterflies. But you can break that word down into two smaller words that are two Latin words that mean scaly wings. So if you have ever touched the wing of a moth or butterfly, you know about the scales on their wings. So if you touched a moth or butterfly and you had dust on your finger, those are the little tiny scales. And I can show you here the scales on the wing of a Taylor's checker spot. So this is a really zoomed in through a microscope image of a checker spot's wing. And you can see these little flecks and dots, those are scales. And actually the really long hair looking ones are scales as well. So they could be long or small and all different colors. And that's where the beautiful patterns that we see on moths and butterflies wings come from, you see scales. The scales help them to get lift when they're flying. 
and they also create these colorful patterns. So the reason we're talking about Taylor's checker spots is, and that I have a job working with them is that they are endangered. So we're really worried about this animal going extinct. They're on the brink of extinction. There are very few left. And why is that? That's actually because their habitat that they rely on is a meadow habitat. And meadows are a, a place where there's open area, small, plants down by the ground, grasses and flowers and so on. Not tr no trees, maybe a few spread throughout, but it's not a forest, it's an open area. And meadows actually make a really nice place to put a farm or build a house or place a road. And that's what's happened to a lot of the meadows that we have. So historically in British Columbia, uh, Taylor Sugar Spots actually lived on Vancouver Island. So I saw that some of you are watching from Victoria and you would have been able to see this butterfly all the way down the island to Victoria and all the way up um, to the Oyster River area. So they would have been widespread. Any meadow between there, you would have been able to find a tailless checker spot, as well as a few of the Gulf Islands as well. And now they're only found um, in two places. There's only two populations left. So there's one population on Denman Island and there's one population right near Oyster River on Vancouver Island. So from all of that space they used to take up, now they're only in two small spots. So that's a really risky thing for a butterfly. Um, they don't move very far. They can't spread back out all over the island on their own. And that's why people are working so hard to save them. Um, and the other thing that has made them endangered is actually that meadows, uh, are hard to maintain. So before there were settlers here, these meadows were maintained by fire and sometimes natural fire and sometimes fire from First Nations. So, and that's a management technique to keep the land open. It makes nice grazing land for deer um, and it also keeps the trees from growing. So if trees grow in a meadow, it won't be a meadow anymore. It becomes a forest. So it takes, um, forces to keep a meadow. It takes maintenance. So a lot of our meadows have actually been lost also to trees growing in and becoming a forest. So a big project that's been going on um, is that on Hel in Helluwell Provincial Park, and that's on Hornby Island off the coast of Vancouver Island, um, they have actually done a massive restoration there. They've cut down lots of trees, which sounds like a bad thing, but for this butterfly who needs a meadow, those trees had to go. They, they were encroaching because no fires had come through in so long. And so they've cut down lots of trees. They've opened up this meadow and made a really nice habitat for checker spots. But if you'll remember, these butterflies don't move very far. So for them to get from Denman Island to Hornby Island is not very likely. They're not very good flyers. So actually the butterflies that I raise get brought to Denman Island in a car as caterpillars in the springtime and they get released there. And that just happened for the first time this spring. So it's very exciting and we'll talk more about it later, but we're establishing a third population of Taylor's checker spots in Helloa. So my job is to make more butterflies. So here in this picture, you can see this is a group of male che Taylor's checker spot butterflies and they are having their breakfast. So these butterflies eat uh, diluted honey. So honey water on Q-tips is their favorite food. Um, it's just a substitute for flower nectar that they would drink in the wild. And here they are, they're all in a sort of mesh cube cage together. And they're having their breakfast and they're also, they have their wings out, they're basking. So they're trying to warm up in the morning sun. They can't really fly until they've warmed up quite a bit in the sunshine. And so they're having their breakfast, they're drinking with their long curly proboscis mouth and they are um, getting ready for the day. These males have a really important task 
and that is to breed our females. So once a male and female have bred, the female will lay eggs. And that's how we get more butterflies. This is really exciting when this happens. So this is a video, I'm going to play it. And if you watch carefully, this female, her abdomen is curled under that leaf. They like to lay their eggs on the underside of the leaf. And they lay them one by one, but they lay many at a time. So there's a, there's a big cluster of eggs being laid here. See if you can watch as they appear from her abdomen. The cluster slowly gets bigger one by one. So this is sped up, of course. She does this over the course of an afternoon. Um, but I put this video in super speed for you. So she'll lay a big cluster of eggs there. I think you have a question about that, yeah? Do. Would you put that question up, Jeff? I thought this would be the timing for it. So here's the question. How many eggs do you think a female tailor's check of spot butterfly can lay? 25, 50, 100, or 400? Well, there we go. 100, okay. It's actually closer to 400. Wow. Isn't that <laughs> impressive? So that would be like the maximum, the record setting female. And 100 isn't a terrible guess because they can lay 100 at a time. So I'll show you this cluster that she lays in this video. Here is a similar cluster of eggs. See how small they are. And um, there's about 100 eggs in there. It's hard to estimate because they lay them in layers. Uh, but yeah, each female can create uh, up to 400 uh, caterpillars. 400 eggs, so very impressive. And that's what I aim for as I'm raising them. I want to get the most possible <laughs> eggs out of each female. So let's see what happens to those eggs over time. So after they're laid, they're yellow, and then later on they become this brown color, then red. Red is good. That means they're developing properly inside of the egg. And finally, they actually turn clear like this. So you can actually see through these eggs and you can see there's a tiny caterpillar in each one. He's curled right up, but you can see the little black dot inside of each egg. That is the little head of a teeny tiny caterpillar. And so let's see how they come out of these eggs. So this is another video. And just before I play it, it's important to know that um, the, cat the eggs, the female lays the eggs on the caterpillars favorite food. So imagine if your favorite food is pizza, this would be like waking up on a gigantic pizza. And that's how it is for the caterpillars. They, they hatch out of their egg and they immediately get to work and start eating leaves because that is a caterpillar's entire job. So let's see them coming out of their eggs here. So this video is sped up as well, and they do a lot of twirling to try and make their way out of the egg. But you can see there's a few crawling around and having a snack already. And when they hatch, they're so small. This is a hard part of my job, is taking care of these almost invisible little caterpillars. But as they come out, so then we'll have suddenly a hundred little tiny caterpillars and they're all siblings and they hang out together. So they'll stay on this leaf and they'll actually make a little, little web and curl the leaf around them and eat inside the leaf together inside this little web that they've made. And that is how they begin their lives. And as they eat, they grow. Caterpillars have a uh, a lot of stages they go through in their life and each caterpillar stage of life is called an instar. So an instar is you reach a new, it's like leveling up. You reach a new instar every time as a caterpillar when you shed your skin. So they shed their skin off their whole body and they pop off their head capsule and underneath is a bigger new caterpillar and they do that six times. So these guys are in the second instar. They've leveled up one time and they're still eating. And if you look carefully, you'll see lots of little black dots here on the screen with the caterpillars. And those black dots are actually um, frass. So Jeff, could you put up the frass question? Okay, oops. 
<clears throat> see, we're going to okay. guess what frass is. <clears throat> Excuse me for coughing. So what do you think frass is? Part of a leaf, insect poop, a measurement of stress in captive animals, or skin that a caterpillar has shed? These are the results. There you go. So who was right? That's great. Yeah, insect poop. You are right. Lots of you said that. And we will see skin that a caterpillar has shed. I'll show you that in our next uh, slide, I think. Um, so frass is insect poop. And something funny about, about this frass, well, first of all, it starts out really tiny when they're little like this. But as they grow, of course, their frass gets bigger. And they also start to fling it. So um, because they live in a group and because caterpillars make really excellent food for birds, they do a lot to prevent birds from wanting to eat them. So one of the things they do is to hide. They're usually underneath a leaf. And if they were to do all of their frassing right there, there might be a pile of frass under where they are and birds could use that as a clue to find them. So they'll actually, when they poo, they fling it a little bit and so that there's no pile of poo under where they're hiding. So they'll fling their frass, and that's um, a, a way that they avoid becoming a bird's snack. So let's see, as they grow a little bit more, here we go. So these Taylor's checker spot caterpillars are, have leveled up a few more times, and they're in the fifth instar. So you can see they've gotten much bigger, more colorful. They have these beautiful orange spots, and they're also fuzzy. So, and if you look in the bottom corner um, on the right-hand side of the screen, there is a really short looking caterpillar that's actually just the shed skin of the caterpillar. So there's that shed skin. You can see lots of frass, it's getting bigger. They're still hanging out by their favorite uh, type of leaf and they're on a paper towel here, that's how we keep them. So we, we put a paper towel in, it gives them a really uh, important spot to bask on top of. They can climb on top and sit in the sun or they can go underneath and get some shade and hide and digest their leaves if they want to. Um, and they also still hang out in a group. So all these caterpillars are brothers and sisters and they still hang out together. So they'll all curl up in the sun together or they'll all go get shade together. It's very sweet. Uh, so Michelle, I'm just going to interrupt you for one second here because someone had a question. Um, I'm looking at the Q and A's here, and somebody is asking, "What's the host plant that they're on?" Some oh. of the questions we can answer later, but um, yeah. yeah, that's a great question. So uh, Taylor's checker spots in the wild will eat a few different plants. They eat a few types of veronica, which is like a small herby leafy plant that likes wet areas. And so in their meadows, it'll grow in sort of the puddles. But they also eat, this plant is actually a plant you probably know. This is long-leafed plantain. Mm -hmm. And it's actually sort of a weed. Um, it's, it's not really an invasive plant, but it's an introduced plant. So it was brought here a few hundred years ago. And now it grows almost all over the place. You can find it in cities, in forests, in parks. And these caterpillars, this species of butterfly, has actually evolved very quickly to be able to eat this introduced plant. So they eat this long-leafed plantain. Um, and that's a great question because actually this, this plant has chemicals in it that the caterpillar uses to protect itself. So that is why they're black and orange. That's actually warning colors in insects. So you're probably familiar with um, black and orange in other insects that you've seen, like maybe a monarch or a, or a viceroy butterfly. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But yeah, so they're eating their long-leaved plantain. I grow gardens of it and pick, when they're this big, I pick hundreds of leaves a day. They are voraciously hungry at this point in their lives. So here they go. Uh, they're walking about, they're using their legs. Um, but I would like you, Jeff, to put up our insect leg question if you Okay, how many legs does an insect have? There you go. Oh, okay, so we got some variety. Okay, good. Well, there's, there's a trick here. So a lot of you said six, some said 10, 
and some said four. So I can imagine why you might have said more than six. And if you look at our caterpillars here, I see if I can play the video again. They look like they have many sets of legs, don't they? But if you look carefully at the front three legs, so the front six, two sets, three sets of two, um, are actually a different kind of leg. So those are those black pointy legs you can see at the front and at the back, those are actually not real legs. Those are called crow legs. So they're more like a big hydraulic suction cup than an actual leg with joints that can walk around. So they're more like little suction cups that kind of just squirt out of the body and, and, and they get filled with liquid and then the liquid retracts and that's how it looks like they're walking. So let's see one more time those pro legs in action. They don't count in our count of six legs. So even a caterpillar still only has six legs technically. See the front three pointy ones and the back are pro legs. So always six legs. That's how we get around that six leg rule for caterpillars. <laughs> okay. So they eat, our caterpillars, they eat leaves, they eat leaves, they poop, they poop, there's frass everywhere for weeks. And then uh, at some point in early August or late July, they decide, you know what? I have done enough for one year. I have done enough growing and eating and I am gonna take a rest. And they do so, so they make a little web inside their paper towel. In the wild, they would do this um, among leaves on the ground or inside of an old rotted log or something. Uh, but in our lab, they do this in paper towel, they web up with their siblings and they curl up and they wait for spring. So they will sleep, it's called diapause in insects, but it's essentially sort of like sleeping. And they basically just lay still all the way until March. So right now, all of my caterpillars look like this. They're just curled up waiting for springtime when they'll wake up and continue to eat leaves. So they'll curl up, they'll wake up in March, eat leaves again, and then it's time to get down to business. So this caterpillar is fully grown. It's curled up, this is called um, into a C. It's curled up in a C and that's because it's about to do something very interesting. And let's watch and see what they do next. So this is not an alien. This is a Taylor's checker spot butterfly still. And you can see that it has shed its fuzzy skin and inside of there is a butterfly chrysalis. So the chrysalis squirms around to get that caterpillar skin off. And now uh, this butterfly is just waiting to burst out of that chrysalis and take flight. Very, very strange step of their life cycle. So in, it was a caterpillar maybe five minutes ago. So this video is sped up, but this doesn't take very long. It happens. As soon as I look away, they like to do this. It took a lot of tries to get a video of it. So I took a really close up picture of a chrysalis to show you. They're so beautiful. So the one you saw in the video, it's going to harden and dry out a little bit over the next day. And then in the morning, it will look like this. They're beautiful, icy blue. And um, you can start to see some of the structures of the butterfly, actually. So if you look closely at a chrysalis, you can see the outline of where the wings will come from. If you look down, I didn't put an arrow to it, but if you look down the, along the front edge of the wing, you can actually see there's a stripy black part and that will be where the antenna is. The eyes are up near the top and you can see spiracles. Spiracles are holes in the body of an insect and that's actually how they breathe. So we breathe through our nose and our mouth and they breathe through holes all along their body they don't have lungs like we do. So they, they breathe through their, their length of their body. So they do still need air just like we do. They just get it in a different way. So this chrysalis, and you can see it has a little stick sticking out of the back end of it. And that's very interesting as well. So here's the face. You could see, you can see the antennas there. This is looking at it, um, looking into the face of the chrysalis. And here's that little stick that was sticking out the back end. 
And that stick is called a cremaster. It's very interesting. This is actually where the idea, uh, or sort of where, maybe that was burrs, but this is the same idea as Velcro, I should say. So this, this stick has little scrapey hooks all along it at the bottom. And before the caterpillar became a chrysalis, it, it made a little messy button of silk. So the same string that they used to make their webs when they webbed up together, it puts a big pad of that onto the, the uh, paper towel or leaf or whatever it's going to make its chrysalis on. And then as it becomes a chrysalis, that cremaster comes out and gets tangled and hooks into that pad of silk. And that's why the chrysalis is able to hang in midair like that. So it's not glued on, it's actually hanging into a tangle of silk. Very interesting. And of course, after a couple weeks, it's time to come out of the chrysalis and be a butterfly. So let's see how that looks. So this butterfly has just burst out of its chrysalis. And of course, when they come out, their wings aren't full size yet because they wouldn't fit inside of there like that. So they actually spend about an hour pumping them full of fluid and moving them around. They spend a lot of time stretching out their proboscis. That's their long, curly, crazy straw mouth. So you can see he'll be flapping his wings. This is a male and he'll be flapping his wings and using his proboscis. And he spends quite a bit of time, um, sort of, we call it like drying out, but they come out and they have to expand their wings and get ready. Oh, there it goes again. Okay, well, I'll let it play. It's, it's interesting to watch them unfurl and, the, and uh, you can see his antenna are out. Now, some of you said that insects only have four legs. And if you look at this butterfly, you can only see four of its legs. But this is another trick. So it has two sets of legs that look normal that you can see it's hanging by. And then the very front set of legs are actually really tiny. They look like little whiskers almost. And they use them to help um, feel food plants and, um, and to feel around in their lives. So they're almost like little tiny finger arms up near their face. So it still has six legs, even though they're not all the same. And here we go, here's a male. So this male is done um, expanding his wings and he's having a snack of honey water using his proboscis there. You can see his beautiful eye and those blue dots are not natural. So I put those on um, after the males come out, they each get a specific pattern of dots I do that just actually with a Sharpie. It's, it's hard to do. I have to do it when the butterflies are cold so that they sit still. And we use that to tell them apart so we can tell who's who and we can know, um, we can know who is mating and uh, where they are, which cage they're in. So here's our group of males. Like I said before, basking. And here's what it looks like. So we have all these big cages set up in the sun. Sun is the magic ingredient for butterflies. They won't do anything that I want them to do unless the sun is shining. So we always hope for good weather once they've emerged. And you can see there are butterflies in each of these cages. Each of these cages has, male, has a few males and at least one female in it. And we're hoping that they'll mate and when they do, they do a sort of Superman hang like this. So the one who's hanging on to the top, that's actually a female. And they're a little bit bigger than the males. And, and they're a little stronger as well. And the hanging upside down one is a male. So he has a one pink dot on his wing. So that's how I know who he is. And the goal out of all of this is to make more caterpillars and put them onto Hornbee. So this spring, for the first time, caterpillars went to Hornby. They made the long journey from the zoo all the way to the island. I think it's three ferry rides between here and there. And uh, we released them. And then, so in March, they were released. And then in June, biologists went back to the island to see if any checker spots were flying around. And they were. So some of our caterpillars survived to adulthood and we saw checker spots flying on Hornby Island 
for the first time in a long time. So historically they lived there and now they live there again. So we're hoping that they establish a population. And then in Canada, there will be three Taylor's checker spot butterfly populations. So this is what it looks like when I'm at work. So this is not how fast I work actually. Um, <laughs> this is sped up, but it's a lot of looking through bins of caterpillars, taking care of them, weighing them. Uh, we do a lot of work to collect a lot of data so we can figure out what is the best way to raise as many of these butterflies as we can. It's a lot of shuffling around little cups and bins and typing into my computer. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about some of the fun stuff about butterflies. We have a few, we're doing okay for time, right, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, we're great, yeah. Awesome. So we're going to um, talk a little bit more generally about butterfly biology here. This is something I'm really interested in. A lot of these rules apply to moths as well. So if you're thinking about butterflies and moths, you can use these sorts of rules and ideas to understand what you're looking at. So let's talk about why is the Taylor's checker spot camouflage so bad? So an orange and black and white butterfly, that's pretty obvious. If a butterfly wanted to hide, they should be brown or green or something. But actually, they're using, let's see. So we saw those like beautiful ice blue chrysalises. Those are quite obvious as well. And they seem like little jewels almost. But this is something I found really interesting. So one day in our garden where I raised the butterflies, I found this beautiful bird poop on the left on this leaf. And if you look at it, it's kind of white and black and speckled. And um, if you look at the chrysalis on the other side of the screen, the chrysalis is almost the exact same size and even the same shape. So it's actually disguising itself as poop, which is a really good strategy. If you don't want a bird to eat you, a really good idea is to look like bird poop because birds don't eat that. That's a great strategy. So they're actually mimicking poop when they're in their chrysalis form. Awesome. If I was a bird, I wouldn't eat it. They're using another strategy called aposematism. So this is another big word that I love. And you, once you've learned this word, you will see this all over the place in nature. So aposematism means warning colors. And that's actually why the checker spots are orange and black and white. That's a warning to say, hey, look, you could eat me, but I am not going to be delicious. You might throw up. And that's true of almost all orange and black bugs. So if you think about something like a ladybug, uh, a monarch butterfly is a good example. Uh, there's lots of beetles. Uh, if you look at a milkweed beetle, they're orange and black as well. All of these animals, are actually slightly toxic to birds. So a bird can eat them and the bird won't die, but it will probably throw up afterwards. So over time, a bird learns, hey look, orange and black snacks are not my favorite. I'm just gonna stop eating orange and black snacks because I puke every time. So the orange and black becomes this universal sign that these animals are less delicious than you would expect. So the Taylor's checker spot, they're orange and black, and they, they are toxic to birds because they're able to, as caterpillars, eat these leaves, the, the long-leaved plantain, and they use chemicals in the leaves and, and keep them in their body in high concentrations, specific chemicals that are toxic. So they're using things out of their food to make themselves stronger and less likely to be eaten. So a bird might eat one Taylor's checker spot, but it probably won't eat more than one once it learns that lesson. So that's aposematism working to protect them. And here they are. Um, here's a checker spot out in its natural habitat. I can't remember what I wanted to tell you on this slide, but this is a beautiful photo. This would be a female, and I think she's actually laying eggs. You can see, almost see her body is curled under. And then I think, yeah, that leads us, sorry, to time for questions. Does that work for you, Jeff? That's great. I'm going to join you here. Um, thank That was fascinating. And uh, there's already some questions lined up here. 
Um, I'm going to start off with one because I have, but my first question would be, um, do these Taylor's checkers plot butterflies have any benefits to the ecosystem? Oh, that's a good question. I thought so. <laughs> yeah. um, so Taylor's checker spots, obviously protecting biodiversity in general is very important. So as humans, we have a huge effect on the environment and there's all these tiny pieces that fit together and we don't really understand all of the connections between everything. So Taylor's checker spots, they don't change their environment dramatically. They eat lots of leaves. Um, they feed a few birds that don't enjoy their snack. Um, but most of all, they're an indicator. So if you can have Taylor's checker spots living in a meadow, that meadow is really a healthy meadow. They need all the native plants to be there. They need the temperature to be right. They need the trees to be cleared. And there are other species that also depend on the meadow. So I think as humans, we like to say like, this species is important because it saves the world all by itself. But with Taylor's checker spots, it's more a thing of, they're one small part of the biodiversity and to protect little bits, we need to protect the little bits to protect the whole because everything is connected. Okay, great, thanks. So there's lots of questions here. Um, so the first one was, um, um, why do butterflies and moths look alike? Oh, that's a good question. So they're actually really closely related. Um, I think they're learning new things all the time, but I think currently we're pretty sure that all butterflies started out as moths and they used to all fly at night. And then over time, they kind of change, they evolve to change their habits to also take up these niches in the daytime. So there's, there's moths mostly at night and butterflies mostly in the day. And the differences between them are slight. It's like antenna shape um, and, and lifestyle, daytime, nighttime, but they're very closely related. So, um, Let's see, oh, okay, no, I'm just gonna go through them in order. There's lots of questions coming in here. Uh, well, actually, I'm gonna ask one. So I think there's a couple of questions um, about um, how do you tell butterflies and moths? Okay, that's a good one. Because it's oh. sort of related, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the first thing to look at is, is it the daytime or the nighttime? So if it's nighttime, that's probably a moth. And some of them look so much like butterflies. Uh, but if you look really closely, check out the antenna. So um, um, I'll draw it. I have paper here. Okay. So a uh, butterfly's antenna are usually clubbed, like you saw on my Taylor's checker spot. A moth antenna are usually either feathery or um, they might be sort of shaped like uh, like this. So this would be a butterfly, these antenna here. Oh, I see. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. And this, this would be a moth if they're feathery. And if they're like this, that's a moth as well. So if they're kind of like, no, no club at the end. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, lots of questions coming in here. So I'm just going to go through them one by one. Um, what are the current population numbers for the two pocket populations? That's a good question. So the, uh, the small populations that remain, the two remaining, we don't have exact numbers of, of butterflies. Um, butterflies, to count them, you basically have to catch them and put marks on their wing like I do with the captive ones and, and catch them the next day. And because they're so endangered, we don't want to be out catching them and interrupting. We want them to do the work of breeding and making more. So we don't have exact numbers. But I can say with butterflies, the population can be huge one year and very small the next, and that's actually perfectly normal. So that's why um, it's really important to get this third population, and hopefully in the future, more populations, because sometimes it's normal for a butterfly population to just disappear from an area, and then they'll have to recolonize over many years into that area and come back. So it's really variable and that's why we need more um, populations of them to guarantee that they don't disappear. Okay, thanks. Next question, is flinging of frass a common tactic for most butterfly species? 
That's a, okay. So um, I've I've seen it happen actually mostly in other caterpillars that are also fuzzy, which is very interesting. So I don't know if there's a link there, but I've seen a fuzzy type of moth caterpillar do it as well. And I could tell they were doing it because they were in a plastic container on my desk at work and I'd hear little ping, ping as they flung their poo <laughs> against the sides of the container. So You can actually um, hear it. You can hear it. Yeah, they're very serious about it. <laughs> wow, that's, so, that's pretty forceful for a little insect. Yeah, um, so it, it happens in other species of moths as well. I know that. I don't know exactly all of them, but. So this one, I'm um, saying, why did you choose to release caterpillars and not adults? Okay, so we release the caterpillars instead of the adults. I think it has to do with the timing. So we want these caterpillars to get into their natural environment and get in and get synced up with the daily and seasonal cycles. So as an insect, they don't make body heat. All of their energy, all of their heat energy comes from the sun. And that means that the passage of time for an insect also depends on the temperature of the day. So we need them in their environment as caterpillars so they can get synced up with the springtime and how fast are the plants growing and how much heat has there been and so on. So they can become adults at just the right time when all the flowers are blooming. If they're in my lab, the timing might be kind of off because the temperatures aren't perfect exactly how they are on Hornby Island. Okay, uh, another question. Um, if they wanted to raise butterflies in Vancouver, what kind should they choose? Okay, so if you wanted to raise butterflies at home, uh, a good way to do it, or a moth, the best way to do it, I think, is to go for walks in June, July, August, and look for caterpillars because then you'll know you've got a native species to your area. Look for a caterpillar and when you find that caterpillar, learn what plant it's on. That's very important. So each one only eats a specific plant. I wouldn't recommend buying butterflies off the internet or um, I wouldn't recommend raising monarchs in this area. It's it's up to you. It's not going to hurt insect populations, but the best way is to find a caterpillar Use the internet, that's a great tool. You can use uh, iNaturalist, that's an app, iNaturalist, and that can help you learn what kind of caterpillar it is and what it's going to become. And then you're on an adventure. You, you just keep feeding it the same food you found it on and, and see what happens. There's all kinds of resources on the internet for what to do when you find a caterpillar, but that way you have a native. And I obviously be careful where you're taking them from, not uh, parks, etc. Oh, I'm just going to add something at that point too. So I, you know, you read a lot of articles about um, um, not cutting down the plants in your garden in the fall because that is breeding ground. So I guess that would fit in with these guys if they're um, hibernating or whatever during the winter. So if you're cutting down plants, then you're, then you're, redu I mean, obviously you're not going to be, it's not for the Taylor's checker spot because they're not here, but um, I guess just a, as a general rule, you've got uh, things like insects, like uh, caterpillars. That's a great, yeah. So um, the best way to take care of your lawn in the fall and winter is to leave it alone. Yeah. There's lots of animals that use those areas as a hibernation ground. And, and then also even the bigger animals that we love to see, birds and mammals, they'll be picking through there, picking out some of the insects through the winter as well. So right. Leaves on the ground is helpful to all the wildlife. Leave the leaves where they are. Okay, thanks. Another question here, do the adults die after reproducing? Can they overwinter as adults? The adults only live for about two weeks in the wild. So they get right down to business. They breed, the females lay eggs, and then that's pretty much it. So they, they will only live about two weeks and then they'll die naturally. Wow, that's a short life. Well, I mean, they've got all the previous stages. Yeah. Um, so this might be a hard one to gauge, but have you lost a butterfly? Oh, <laughs> um, 
I, I had a few escape my clutches this summer. I had a couple males fly away, but they don't go very far. They landed on the nearest bush to take a break. So I was able to get them back. Okay. But, <laughs> so I didn't have any escape right into the sky, but it's definitely stressful. <laughs> um, next question. How big of an area does a population need to be successful? Mm. Well, this is a question that I would love to know the exact answer to. Yeah. This is research that we're working on. So um, I'm hoping to do some research with this. We need to know, because the populations go up and down so much, we need to know how big of a population do you need for that to balance out so that it can re-colonize uh, areas. So the bigger, the better. Uh, at this point is all we can say for sure. Here's a cute question here. Do you name the butterflies? <laughs> I, I named them A1. Okay. J4 this year. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, okay, so we, we already answered that question before, yet yeah, somebody else answered that. Okay, uh, about how many eggs? Okay, uh, I'm just going through the questions here. There's still quite a few here. Um, um, so one person's asking is, are, are all white, black, and well, I guess it's orange or red butterflies, are they, well, they're saying poison, but are they toxic? Okay, so no. And that's another, um, another strategy they're using, and that's mimicry. So mm -hmm. I can't think, oh, so I'm from Ontario, so I don't know all the BC examples yet. I haven't learned them. But in Ontario, we have a, a butterfly that looks almost exactly like a monarch, but it's called a viceroy. And they're actually pretty tasty to birds. And they look the exact same. So they're using, they're being copycats. They're saying, well, maybe I don't taste very good either, but they actually do. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but I think it works on birds. Okay. If you touch a butterfly's wing, will it die because it's fragile? Okay. So it can lose some of those scales. So it may not be able to fly as well. And obviously the wings are very, very fragile. You wouldn't want to bend it or anything, but right. the butterfly will probably survive. So if there's a butterfly in your house and you touch it, trying to put it back outside, it will live. It's going to be okay. Same with a moth. Okay. That's good to know. Um, yeah. I think you just answered that question. The wings are fragile, but yeah. Okay. You answered that one. And um, here's a question. How many caterpillars did you take to Hornby? This Past spring, 900 went to Hornby, 900 wow. and something. And next spring, right now, hopefully, I have 1,300 sleeping caterpillars that are going to go to Hornby. So if everything goes well over the winter, 1,300 more. Okay. And you sort of answered this before, but um, what foods do you feed the butterflies? Maybe so the, yeah. So the adult butterflies, they drink that honey water off mm -hmm. of Q-tips. Uh, and also, we offer them some flowers when we have flowers growing in our garden. They can drink the nectar off of. And here's something great. This year, we actually also offered them some cougar poop. So uh, because we're at the zoo, we have access to all these wild animals, or, or um, animals, I should say. And butterflies actually need, beyond nectar, they also need some salt and some special enzymes that they actually only get from... Um, sometimes from urine of other animals in the wild, sometimes from a puddle, and sometimes they'll actually land on poop and, and absorb some of the nutrients from that. That's something that exclusively male butterflies do, and it's called puddling. So if you ever see a butterfly landed on a pile of poo in the wild, it's actually taking up nutrients, and that, those nutrients are gonna help it to, to be a better mate. Um, so they puddle as well. So we actually offered them some cougar poop this year and they were a little bit interested. We're going to try more next year. That's interesting. Okay. It doesn't sound very tasty. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you've sort of talked about this before. Um, oh, Annie's got a lot of questions here. Can butterflies escape from the cage? Mm, ideally, no. There's zippers okay. to keep them in. So. Um, and where can you find a lot of butterflies and caterpillars? So the time of year is important. Look in June and July and anywhere where there's native plants. So probably Campbell Valley Regional Park or a park near you where there's a forested area with 
lots or a meadow with lots of native plants. So people's gardens aren't a great place because usually those flowers aren't from here. And if a flower isn't from here, there won't be insects here who eat it. And that's why native plants are so important because they add to the biodiversity. If you have a plant from somewhere far away, nothing here is gonna use it to live on or in or eat. Okay, and he has a last question here. Um, well, and then we'll wrap things up. It's like, will a butterfly be lonely if there's only one butterfly in the cage? Oh, the, okay, so no, I don't think they'll feel lonely, but they definitely feel the urgency to find a mate. So females will display their wings if they're alone. They, they, they're basking in the sun, but they're also doing some fluttering and they're communicating that way. And males in the wild would actually fly around and search and patrol to find a female. And they would also sit on a perch and defend a little territory and hope that a female comes by. So they definitely make a, a strong effort to find other butterflies of their species. And they also would chase away, a male will chase another male away. And uh, well, there's one f other question that came in, but I think you really kind of answered that. Um, are you part of a checker spot team at the zoo? Good. Okay, so I am, I, I work for WPC. I work with another couple of people at the zoo, but we are part of a big team that involves the provincial government, BC parks, people on Denman Island. Uh, there's a lot of people involved. And you can find out more about that on the WPC website if you ever want. Um, okay, well, first of all, so thank you so much, Michelle. That was uh, really, really fascinating. Um, yeah, Please. webinar presentation. I mean, I learned all sorts of things about butterflies that I didn't know. So, so thank you so much for that. Um, and also some of those videos and really close up photos were amazing. So again, thanks again. I also want to thank uh, Pacific Parklands Foundation for hosting this webinar. And um, yeah, so unfortunately we don't have the slide here with the, um, but again, it's Wildlife Preservation Canada, Pacific Parklands Foundation, and Metro Vancouver Regional Park. So check those up. Oh, there we go. There we go. So there are the, thanks Janet. <laughs> There are the URLs there for the websites. So our next webinar is, um, it's next Wednesday, October 21st. It's called Bear IQ. We actually, ho we hosted this bear awareness webinar in September and we're bringing it back by popular demand. So you can find out about it by going to the Pacific Parklands Foundation's Facebook page. They'll be posting it tomorrow morning. You can also go, if you go to the Metro Vancouver website and you um, type in Campbell Valley Nature House in the search engine search bar, um, it'll come up on the um, Nature House page and it'll be listed there if you want to join us. So again, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you um, for Pacific Parklands Foundation for hosting the webinar. Thanks Michelle and everybody have a great rest of the day and everybody stay well. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you.